Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. So much to report on, so much happening, so much going on in the world today. America's on fire, the world's on fire. It's a global insurrection against banker occupation. We've been telling you about it for years now. It's happening all over the world. Please. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Where does that poem come from? It sounds really famous. Uh, I don't know. Where is it from? It's from the Statue of Liberty at the base. Statue of Liberty was given to America as a gift by France. Madame Liberty it is. Uh, you know, the United States was founded on the principles of the, of the Enlightenment that happened in France and in Scotland. But I thought this image of, of Lady Liberty, of the Statue of Liberty, in this headline that I want to turn to from the Daily Mail, Trump says New York has been lost to thugs and lowlife scum after looters ransack Fifth Avenue and curfew is brought forward from 11 p.m. to 8 p.m. until end of week. But Cuomo and de Blasio still refuse to call in the National Guard. And as you can see, there's some looters on the front page. And we've talked about the looters at the top from the very beginning, the trillions and trillions of dollars being printed in the Cantillion effect. But here's Lady Liberty right there on the ground. A trinket, probably made in China, sold in Times Square. And this is quite a fitting image for the rest of the stories we have to cover, Max. Oh, absolutely. The poem resonates with double entendre, with deep meaning, with uh, echoes of the past and people coming to America, coming to New York, coming to Ellis Island with dreams to breathe free and only to be stomped on and have their life choked out of them. I can't breathe. Dead. Ooh, what's happening here in America? Of course, yearning to breathe free is very important that this is an, a, a part of the problem right now in America is obviously we have the racism and the state power exercised through the police force, which is literally has the knee on the, you know, your, your boot on the neck of the populace. Obviously, black Americans are at the bottom of this, but at, you know, it's, it's layers of this absence of being able to breathe free. And we see this through the injustice built into the system where there's a certain select group of people who do have privilege. Of course, we are supposed to be, a, you know, a, a nation founded by these truths that are self-evident that all men are created equal. That may be true, but if some are given privilege that negates all the equality that we have at birth. Michael Hudson, Fed's $10 trillion, defends assets of the rich. So the Fed has revived the stock market downturn. He's referring to the stock market booming. It comes up and what it said is, folks, you can bail out the stock market, give us your junk bonds. That's sort of like the Statue of Liberty for wealthy people. Give us your stocks, sell us your bonds, We'll buy them all up at Federal Reserve expense and we'll purchase them. And we'll also do our own forward buying to manipulate the stock market by promising to buy our stock so the higher price in the forward market. So that's going to create a speculative demand for stock. So the speculative demand for stocks by Federal Reserve manipulation and the actual flow of funding money into the stock market from the government has been pushing it back up, giving the illusion of prosperity, at least for the 10 percent. That's right. The Statue of Liberty is on this floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm a buyer. I'm a buyer. I'm a buyer. I'm buying it all. I'm buying it all. Right. So as Michael Hudson has pointed out, the Federal Reserve Bank is buying everything. I would equate the stock market today with an exit scam, right? So the 10 percent that own stocks in America are exiting America and they're taking all the valuable assets with them. And to fund that purchase, the Fed is giving them trillions of dollars of free money. That's the way we see it. That's the way it's working. And that explains the disconnect between valuations on most of the stocks in the S&P 500 and the fact that unemployment is skyrocketing, there's riots on the street, and uh, all kinds of other things are cutting away at the viability of the United States economy. Doesn't matter because they've got the green light to secede. The rich are seceding. It's, 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 it's not right, and yet that's what's happening. Well, actually, I want to say that this has happened throughout history. And I think, for me, the United States most mimics, but it mimics often like a lot of different empires that have fallen before it. I think there's been 12 so far, and this is part of that Thucydides trap of, of a great power not wanting another to rise. Compared to Rome, Rome had the same situation. The people inherited an amazing republic and a flourishing, powerful nation that had arts and amazing architecture and building and thought and stuff like that. And then it came, turned into a, a tawdry empire where the elite 
like just plundered the nation. So the next bit from Michael Hudson's quote is, okay, now we have it trickled down to the population where they're ransacking, you know, the shops on Fifth Avenue. But where did the ransacking start, right? And let's go back one step for the past 12 years. This is something Kaiser Report has talked about. There is only one reason for a stock or a bond price to go up, Michael Hudson said, and that's because of the flow of funds into the stock market. What had been supporting the stock market for the last 12 years was very largely stock buybacks by companies using their revenue to sort of close down their business, disinvest, and buy their own stocks to at least keep the prices up. Well, what's flowing into the markets right now. This is something you've talked about a lot, that this stock buybacks is hollowing out, that like it's plundering the balance sheet of these companies, of these publicly listed, their public stocks. The wealth of the nation is being plundered, the last dregs of it. It's an exit scam, right? So they're getting trillions from the central bank and they're not reinvesting it in, in CapEx. They're not reinvesting it in hiring people. They're not building plants. They're buying back their own stock, boost up the value of their stock options, and they're systematically going to just bolt. We won't hear from them anymore because they're leaving a carcass. What we see on the streets of New York City is pretty much going to be the new normal. The streets of New York, okay, let's continue with this sort of analogy looking at the symbolism of Lady Liberty. And, you know, Lady Liberty has that torch, of course. That torch, you used to be able to climb up to it, but you haven't been able to go into that torch since July 1918 because of the Black Tom explosion. Black Tom is a little artificial island just off of Ellis Island where the Statue of Liberty is. And it was blown up by the Germans in 1916 during World War I and because there was a munitions there. And in fact, one of the, um, the boats ready to ship off with munitions to the allies in, in uh, Europe was filled with uh, munitions for Russia that uh, the United States was shipping. But the explosion was so huge, it was uh, the equivalent of a 5.0 uh, Richter scale earthquake in New York, and it was felt as far away as Philadelphia. But remember, that whole World War I, that was the end of the last empire. That was the end of the British Empire. They were fighting off the German rising power, and the, the world w was chaos for decades during that whole period. Um, but where did this looting start? How did the looting start from the very, very top? Because we've gone from the people looting the shops to the merchants essentially looting their, they looted the wealth of the nation through stock buybacks. But how did it all begin? And, you know, with this transfer of power and wealth between nations that we've always seen in the past for the previous 12 passing of the torch between empires and great powers. The United States uniquely gave their power away themselves because of their own nobility, because of the privileged class. And there's a fantastic article, it's very long, but um, I'm gonna pick out some of the segments and you should go read it yourself, look this up, it's on unheard.com, U-N-H-E-R-D. COVID has exposed America as a failed state. It's hard to view the U.S. at this point as anything other than a cautionary tale. You know, they go over the fact that the U.S. has blown $5 trillion on, on pointless wars in the Middle East and mostly driven by, you know, the liberal intelligentsia like Clintons, like Blair's, like Rachel Maddow, like those sort of people who are, are saying, like, we're going to spread our democracy and instead has blown the wealth of the nation and the ability of the nation. But... Now it wants the world to join in a fight against China. You know, you see we're, we're now in an ho almost hostile war with China. We're banning even flights, passenger flights from China, not because of COVID-19, but because we don't want Chinese people here. But they point out that the truth is that globalization, the central political dream of Clinton and Blair, Obama and Cameron, was never real. It was a process by which advanced Western economies unilaterally surrendered their manufacturing capacity to a rival growing power, China, which instead of reciprocating according to the Panglossian calculations of the neoliberal theorist, practiced a traditional and ruthless mercantilism in pursuit of its own interests. Never mix. Globalism with mercantilism, you end up with uh, mercantilism, right? Uh, so America, as you point out, they had this ideal, the third way, the uh, 
globalization, the neoliberalism, the Washington consensus, that other countries would be happy to send us an equal amount of goods and services that we're sending them because they like us, because they enjoy Tom Cruise movies, because uh, Hollywood. Uh, but these countries said, you know what, I think you're going to give us all of your manufacturing, we'll keep that, and we'll take everything else too. So now here we are 20, 30 years later, and um, folks are beginning to realize that to restart a manufacturing economy here in America is going to require more money than was required during World War II. But wait for it, the country's already 25 trillion in debt. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. But when you look at the news, when you look at what is being presented as the resistance, as the response to this ongoing turmoil, but the collapse of the American system, you know, the mass opioid overdoses, the mass death, the mass anguish, there's obviously deaths of despair. There's something going on that nobody wants to look at, certainly in the elite. But the looting that is nonstop in this economy was intentional. As they point from this uh, quote from Michael Lind in the tablet, he said, politicians pushing globalization like Clinton may have told the public that the purpose of NAFTA and of China's admission to the World Trade Organization was to open the closed markets of Mexico and China to American products made on American soil, everything from corn to chemicals to computers. But U.S. multinationals and their lobbyists 20 years ago knew that this was not true. Their goal from the beginning was to transfer the production of many products from American soil to Mexican soil or Chinese soil or to take advantage of foreign low wage, non-union labor, and in some cases, foreign government subsidies and other favors. Some people are calling this um, protest across America right now, Bolshevik re revolution to kind of make a reference to the workers' uprising uh, that we saw in um, the old uh, imperial Russia. Uh, and um, you've got a new imperium here in America of elites or cantillionaires. And the workers suddenly realize that, wait a minute, we don't want to live under a dictatorship. We don't want to live under a monarchy. Let's have a good old-fashioned Bolshevik revolution, which is what's seemingly happening from coast to coast. You know, the population is saying, just vote in Biden. Biden was part of this 20 years ago. He was in power. He helped China ascend to the WTO. They knew their intention was to undermine the American population by aggregating wealth for themselves by sending these jobs overseas. So, you know, that is not the answer. The looting has to stop, and the looting at the top has to stop first. If you vote for Biden, you ain't smart. <laughs> hey, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Caitlin Long of Avanti Bank, located in the hootin' tootin' rip-roaring state of Wyoming. Caitlin, welcome back. Thanks, Max. It's great to be back. Technically, we're not a bank yet. We're, we're technically Avanti Financial Group. We are applying for a bank license. That is a that's a big, heavy lift, as I'm learning. Exactly so. So let's talk a little bit about it. You're applying for a license for a bank in Wyoming. Tell us about what you're trying to do over there. Is it a Bitcoin-friendly bank? Uh, what is needed? Uh, the bank, what problems does this, tell us more. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's interesting to have someone from this community forming a bank, uh, but I'm doing it in part because this is something we need. We need a regulatory compliant bridge to go back and forth between the digital asset industry and the traditional banking industry. And there are a handful of banks in the United States that service the industry. They're pretty well known. Um, Silvergate, Signature, Metropolitan. In fact, actually just last week, uh, JP Morgan, it came out, is, uh, is now serving uh, two, two of them. I think it's Coinbase and, um, uh, and Gemini uh, got through the JP Morgan process. So you may be wondering, why on earth do we need more? Well, for one thing, the FDIC in the U.S. does not allow banks do, to provide custody services for digital assets. And so what that means is that all the banks that are providing payment services, that small number of banks that are providing payment services, can't also custody digital assets. And you may be wondering, why does that matter? At the end of the day, it matters a lot because 
you want to be able to set to, to settle the payment and digital assets legs of trades simultaneously. This is one of the big reasons why stable coins have taken off. They've really kind of, in some ways, become the killer app of this technology, ironically, right? Um, uh, and we're starting to see now the stablecoin daily volume is in some, on some, some days is pretty close to the Bitcoin uh, volume traded. Uh, and that's because these, these stable coins actually can settle simultaneously against Bitcoin and other digital assets. And US dollars cannot. And while you're forced to, to segregate the banking relationships into a different legal entity than where the digital assets are held, it means that you actually have to settle both of those legs sequentially because you're dealing with two different entities settling the trades. So, so there's counterparty risk, there's a lot less trading velocity, a lot less liquidity coming into Bitcoin and other digital assets as a result of this problem. And that's what we're trying to fix. Well, there's actually two parts to this story. And one part is, oh yeah, there's a need for a Bitcoin friendly bank. And you've just kind of articulated the case for that very well. The other side of the story is that Wyoming itself, the state of Wyoming, looked out across America and saw a little state called Delaware and how much they were successful in becoming the go-to place in America to incorporate for just about every company in America is incorporated either in Delaware or uh, Nevada. Right. And uh, Wyoming uh, could become a, a, the go-to destination for this new wave, this new technology, this new, you know, a lot of people compare Bitcoin to the, where the internet was in the mid 1990s, right before it became a multi-trillion dollar industry. If Wyoming got a piece of that business, Wyoming would do phenomenally well. How, and so when you say you're in the process of getting this bank through, do the legislature and the politicians in Wyoming understand that this is probably a once in a century opportunity for them? Yes, they do, they absolutely do. And uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's why we've, we've done what we've done. We've now had three legislative sessions in Wyoming and there have now been 20 different laws enacted, all of which are enabling. The only one that's prescriptive is, is the, the bank charter. And what I mean by that, enabling legislation is, is, is what even I think most libertarians, the hardcore um, you know, anarchist types probably say, we don't need that legislation at all, natural law can, can control. But most, uh, I think most folks would, would agree that if we have enabling positive legislation that says we have the right to do this, that that's okay. Um, as opposed to the restrictive legislation that says you can't do this and, and, and here's why. Um, we do obviously have that with the bank charter uh, because in order to be able to plug into the payment system, you have to comply with the standards set by the Federal Reserve. Every bank has to do that. That's just a given. It is what it is. But the, all the other legislation Wyoming passed is enabling, and, uh, and it is designed to, to attract this industry here. And boy, folks are coming. Um, ironically, I think given everything that's happening in the world, more folks are considering actually moving here as opposed to what most folks do with Delaware, which is use its laws, but don't actually live or do business there. Um, I think we're actually starting to see folks want to move to Wyoming. It's interesting. There's a tremendous depopulation in the cities now, people looking for right. wider spaces. Yep. And certainly Wyoming's got a lot of empty space uh, for sure. <laughs> Uh, now, you mentioned J.P. Morgan there for a second. I want to focus on that. So everybody knows who's been following Bitcoin or J.P. Morgan the last 10 years. They started off as bitter no-coiners, as we say. They're very much against <laughs> this idea of Bitcoin. And then gradually over 10 years, Jamie Dimon finally, you know, it took them a while to understand the learning curve. You know, it's not easy to understand Bitcoin. It took Jamie Dimon maybe a little longer than a lot of other people. Uh, but he finally, I think, gets it now. So now he is trying to make some money in this business. But uh, isn't it, I mean, so your efforts in Wyoming seem to have forced the mainstream banks in New York to kind of figure out that, hey, we don't want to lose this business. Now you've got an 800 pound gorilla in the room and Jamie Dimon uh, potentially stealing some business, right? So isn't the urgency, doesn't this make the urgency of what you're doing in Wyoming that much more urgent? 
Caitlin. Yes, it does. And I'll tell you something. Here, here's the here's the little secret. Everyone looks down. Uh, the New Yorkers especially look down on Wyoming, right? And think, you know, what can what can Wyoming? What can that small rural agricultural state do to challenge New York? Well, guess what? We moved so much faster than New York. We have legal clarity on digital asset transactions. They're legally enforceable in the state of Wyoming. Um, in fact, as, as, as we talked about when I was last on your show, Wyoming has given the same commercial law treatment for digital, for virtual currencies, including Bitcoin, as money under commercial law. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that Bitcoin is legal tender. We did try to do that and realized under the U.S. Constitution, we couldn't pull that off. By the way, gold is legal tender in Wyoming, but we couldn't do that with Bitcoin because gold's mentioned in Article, uh, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, I believe it is. But um, needless to say, we did it with, um, we, we basically said, all right, well, if it can't be legal tender, then it gets the same kind of what's called super negotiability. That means that if you actually get a Bitcoin, um, you take it free of any adverse claims. So if somebody else has a claim to that Bitcoin, if a lender put a lien on that Bitcoin, for example, and you didn't know about it, you took it free and clear of that lien. And right now, you may be wondering, well, who's putting liens on Bitcoin? Why would I, why would I care? Well, there are people now finally starting to put liens on Bitcoin uh, because Bitcoin are being lent out, and that's what lenders do. They put lien on the, uh, liens on the collateral. But as Trace Mayer likes to point out, we're not necessarily solving the attack vectors of today. We're looking, we're skating to where the puck is going to be and thinking about where the attack vectors are going to come from. And one of them could be that if Bitcoin is a million dollars, guess what? Now all of a sudden, the you know, plaintiff's attorneys start coming after everybody and saying, hey, you bought a Bitcoin that somebody had a lien against, and now it's mine, and then trying to take it away from you. Those are the kind of attack vectors that legally are there, and, and we're trying to shut them down. But back to JP Morgan, to get that protection, Max, he'd have to come to Wyoming. He'd have to move JP Morgan to Wyoming. And so uh, we have a huge advantage. Um, and in fact, actually, that's the only reason, to be honest, why these new bank charters would be under consideration for getting access to the Fed's payment system. And that's because we have legal clarity to digital asset transactions in Wyoming. There are no other states that have done it. And until they do it, their banks can't get the same access that ours can because they don't pass that pretty fundamental threshold, which is... Are these assets legally enforceable? And um, what happens in the event one of the banks goes down? Is the bankruptcy a god awful mess, or is it really clear because we know exactly how to treat these assets in a bankruptcy? That stuff is critical. It's 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 sort of the base protocol layer of the legal system, and it doesn't exist in any state other than Wyoming. And that's why we can get our banks to have a reasonable shot at getting getting access to the payment system. So if I see Jamie Dimon riding a horse on Park Avenue. <laughs> I'll know what that's all about. So listen, I want to yep. ask you a question here. You mentioned gold. And, yep. um, you know, uh, let me set this up here. I know that rehypothecation is a big concern of yours. It's something we've talked about before on this show. It was in the news recently when it looks like the ETF that goes by the symbol GLD is now reporting some Bank of England gold as their own. So, uh, you know, rehypothecation meaning that the same assets loaned out many times uh, without any oversight. And apparently this is what's going on with Bank of England and the uh, ETF GLD. Do you see this becoming a problem with Bitcoin? Well, it can. Um, the, more, the more adverse financialization that happens with Bitcoin, it can. That's why I've actually been pretty critical of some of the lenders, the Bitcoin lending companies, that are out there saying, uh, you know, we, we will rehypothecate your Bitcoin. They're doing the same thing to Bitcoin that is, has been do done to gold. It's funny, when uh, you and I were talking about that, that tweet from a, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, we, we engaged in some private messages. That, you know, this is, people have been suspecting that this was true in the, in the gold market, but you, you get little snippets of proof along the way, and that was a pretty big breadcrumb that proved that in fact actually there are multiple owners of the same collateral and you don't know how how financialized your your gold is if you own it in paper form you don't really know um, if 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 there's real collateral backing that and the same thing absolutely can happen to bitcoin um, and that's again why the wyoming laws are structured the way they are i believe in in clear property rights and rehypothecation 
just just obfuscates property rights. It, 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 you can have two or three or four or maybe eight or 10 different parties reporting in their brokerage statements or on their financial statements that they own the very same asset when if you collapse it all down, there's really only one of those assets. And that's a, that's a problem. And, and so uh, we believe in good fences make good neighbors in Wyoming. We fought what was effectively a civil war in Wyoming, the Johnson County Cattle War, over can you fence off your property and defend it against uh, adverse uh, against adversaries? And the answer is yes. You know, the fencing of the West happened, and it and that was literally a battle over whether you could enforce your property rights. And Wyoming believes pretty strongly that you can and should enforce your property rights, and we should clarify that. Caitlin Law, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser. I'd like to thank our guest, Caitlin Long, over there in Wyoming on the Avanti Bank Project. Coming soon. Hey, uh, if you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.